Have you ever seen a function that uses the keyword yield instead of return? The yield keyword is what turns a regular function into a generator function. Let's see how this keyword works. At a high level, yield is similar to return in a regular function. Both keywords send back a value from the function to the main program. The key difference between yield and return is what happens after the value is sent back. In a regular function, once the value has been handed back to the main program, Python stops executing the function. If the function body contains more lines of code, they will not be executed. In a generator function, the yield keyword works differently. After passing back the value to the main program, Python pauses the function's execution. If there are remaining lines of code in the function, they will be executed if the main program tells the generator to resume execution. Because generators can be paused and resumed, they can execute multiple yield statements. This lets the main program request values one at a time, which the generator produces only when asked. Okay, but how does the main program tell the generator to resume and pass back the next value? To see how, let's build this simple generator in a notebook. Our generator will yield three values, one, then two, then three. Now that our generator is defined, let's see how to use it in the main program. Just like a regular function, a generator can be called. But when we run the cell, we don't get the value from the first yield statement. Instead, we get a generator object. That's because when calling a generator, none of the code in its body is immediately executed. Calling a generator simply creates a generator object. You can think of this object as a little machine that knows how to produce values, but doesn't produce any values until we ask it to. For future use, let's store this little machine in a variable called genValuesObject. Then, to ask our generator to produce a value, we can call the next function and pass in the generator object as an argument. This function is what allows the main program to control when the generator begins or resumes its execution. In our analogy, calling the next function is like pulling the lever on our machine to ask it to produce a value. More specifically, the next function call tells the generator to start running until it reaches the first yield, hands back the value 1, and pause there. Running the cell, we indeed get the value 1. At this point, the generator is paused and waiting for the main program to ask for the next value. To get the next value, we call next on the generator again. To display the first two values, let's add print statements. The second function call resumes the generator from where it left off, runs until it reaches the second yield statement, and hands back the value 2. Running the cell, we now also get 2, as expected. To ask for the final value as well, we can simply call the next function again and print the result. This resumes the generator a final time until it reaches the third yield statement and hands back the value 3. Running the cell, we get 3. At this point, the generator has no more values left to produce. If we try to ask for another value, we get a stop iteration error, which is Python's way of telling us the generator has run out of values. Great, clearly this works, but it is tedious to manually write out several next calls, and we run the risk of hitting a stop iteration error. An easier and safer way to iterate through the values of a generator is to use a for loop. You're probably familiar with using a for loop to iterate through a list like 1, 2, 3. We can similarly iterate through the values of our generator object by substituting the object for the list. When using a generator, the for loop header automatically calls the next function at the beginning of each iteration. 
The program also automatically exits the loop after the generator yields its last value. Running the cell, we get the same three values as before. And since the loop knows when to stop asking for values, we don't need to worry about getting a stop iteration error. Finally, note that the for loop header can also handle the generator call itself, so we don't need to create a separate variable first. Awesome, now that you know how generators work, you might be wondering, when are they useful? To see the purpose of generators, we'll use a slightly different example. Suppose we want to build a program that finds prime numbers within a range of integers. To calculate the primes, let's write a regular function called getPrimesList that takes two parameters, start and end, and returns all the primes within that range as a list. In the body of the function, we can create an empty list to store the primes we will find. Then, we loop through each number in the range from start to end plus one. For each number, we first check if it is smaller than two. If it is, we immediately move to the next iteration since we know it can't be a prime. For numbers that are greater or equal to two, we check if it's prime by testing whether any smaller number divides it evenly. You don't need to worry about the details of the code here. The important point is that calculating primes takes a bit of work. If the function determines that a number is prime, we append it to our list. Once we've checked every number in the range, we return the full list of primes. Now let's use this function to get the primes between 50 and 100. Running the cell, we get a list that contains all the prime numbers in that range. This works great when we're only looking for primes between 50 and 100, but what if we wanted to search a much larger range, say 50 to 10 million? With our current approach, Python would have to check every number in that range and store all the primes in the list before we can use a single one. And that list could take up a significant amount of memory. If we only needed to process the prime numbers one at a time, for example, to find the first prime number that satisfies some condition, like ends in a seven, storing all primes up to 10 million at once would be wasteful. Generators offer a great solution to this problem. Starting from a function that builds a list of primes, it's easy to create a generator that yields primes one at a time. First, since we won't be building a list anymore, we can remove the empty list assignment, the append statement, and the return statement. Then to convert our function into a generator, we yield the current number if it is prime. Finally, let's rename the function to indicate that it's a generator. Just like in our previous example, running the cell gives us a generator object. It does not calculate any primes. We can use this object by saving it to a variable and calling next. When we run the cell, the generator will run until it finds the first prime in our range, yields it back to the main program, and then pauses. Running the cell, we get 53, the first prime in our range. Each of the following times we call next, the generator resumes, finds the next prime, and pauses again until it's asked to calculate another one. The generator does just enough work to compute the next prime before going on a coffee break. Programmers call this work only when asked behavior, lazy evaluation. So you could say the generators are lazy. On the other hand, a regular function's do everything at once behavior is called eager evaluation. Because generators are lazy and produce only one value at a time, they barely use any memory. As before, if we want to print all values from the generator one at a time, we can use a for loop. That's great, but generators aren't the only way to produce values one at a time. Instead, 
we could do the same thing by writing a for loop directly in the main program. To make this loop run outside the generator, we need to change the range inputs and remove the yield statement and replace it with a print statement. Running the cell, we get the same output. Both approaches use very little memory since they produce one value at a time. So why bother with a generator? Well, generators are worth our time because just like regular functions, they can make our code more modular and reusable. For example, suppose we want to use our prime generating code to find the first prime in our range that ends with 7. When using a for loop, this can be done by checking if the prime ends with a 7 before printing it and breaking out of the loop after the first prime ending in a 7 is found. Running the cell, we get 67, the first prime between 50 and 100 that ends in 7. So clearly, our for loop code works, but notice how the logic for producing primes and the logic for consuming them are tangled together in the body of the for loop. This makes the code less readable. For someone unfamiliar with our code, it's hard to know where the production of primes ends and their consumption begins. In contrast, when using a generator, the production of primes is neatly contained inside the generator. So, to determine the first prime that ends in 7, we can simply test for it in the loop body. See how using a generator neatly separates the production of primes from the code that consumes them? This makes our code more readable and understandable to others. But improving readability is not all we've done here. By disentangling production and consumption, we've made our code more modular and reusable. For example, suppose that a different part of our program needs to find the first prime that ends in 1. To do that with a generator, we can simply copy and paste the loop that checks for primes ending in 7 and modify it to output the first prime ending in 1. However, without a generator, to calculate the first prime ending in 1, we need to duplicate the prime calculation code and modify it. The duplication makes our code harder to maintain. If in the future, we want to swap out our prime calculation code for a more efficient algorithm, we would need to remember to update both for loops. With a generator, we only need to change the logic in one place. That's the power of separating production from consumption. We don't need to keep track of and update multiple copies of the same code. Awesome, now you understand how generators can reduce memory usage and make our code more readable, modular, and easier to maintain. That's a lot of benefits, but generators aren't perfect for every situation. Because generators produce values on demand without storing them, once a value is yielded, the generator moves on and you can't ask for that value again. This is a problem for some calculations, where having the full list of values is convenient. For example, estimating the standard deviation of a list of numbers. If we're ever in a situation where we need access to all the values from the generator at once, we can simply cast the generator to a list. This will return a list of all items that we can store in memory. Awesome, let's wrap up with a summary of what we've learned. When it comes to memory, generators are efficient. They process values one at a time without storing them all. The flip side is that the values generated in previous iterations can't be reused. However, a generator can always be cast to a list of all its values. Finally, generators separate the production of values from their consumption. This makes our code more modular and easier to maintain. If you'd like to practice what you've learned in this video, check out the notebook we created. It has a few exercises to get you started. We're working on lots more Python explainer videos like this one, so be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out. If you have any questions or topics that you'd like to learn about, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. 
Thanks for watching.